What's up y'all? In this video, we're gonna talk about Candela Obscura. Candela Obscura is an original game by the folks behind Critical Role and it's published by Darrington Press. The lead game designers are Spencer Stark and Rowan Hall. So what is Candela Obscura about? The game is all about dipping your toes into the world of the spooky and supernatural. Think ghost hunters, but with a sprinkle of occult and a whole lot of danger. So in this game, you're part of a group named, yep, you guessed it, Candela Obscura. So Candela Obscura is a secret society in New Fair, which is an old timey city that's literally built on top of ancient ruins that are filled with potent leftover magic. But as much as humanity has tried, their understanding of the magic is still a little foggy. They know it's from a place much different than their normal world, but what the heck is it? Why is it here? That's anyone's guess, and it's Candela Obscura's mission. Now when you play the game as a part of this group, you're gonna go all around the Fairlands, which is like the main setting of the game. You could be doing anything from wrestling with horrors in the jam-packed streets of the Varnish downtown area, sniffing out clues for bizarre missing cases in the cornfields of Tottergrass, or even daring to explore the creepy underground ruins of Old Fair. Your main goal is to put a stop to these supernatural bad guys before they wreck our world. Now the world of Candela Obscura is just like our world, but there is a twist because there's this thing called magic, spelled with a K, that your average Joe wouldn't even believe exists. And the only thing separating our world from the magical one is a very mysterious barrier called the flare. And the flare has weak spots, or as they call them in the game, thinnings. And through these thinnings, magic slips into our world. And all those myths and legends you've heard, those are just attempts by normies to explain what magic is. It's kind of like how our entire history in the real world is just attempts to explain alien visitation as you learn in ancient aliens. Now here comes the fun part, the magic. It can actually sneak into everyday objects, places, even people, and it completely changes them into something kind of weird and mysterious. And if the thinning is wide enough, even creatures from the magic realm can stroll right into our world. And anything touched by magic from another realm, we call that phenomenon. And then there's what we call bleed. It's like magic's bad cousin that messes things up. If you have too much bleed, well, it's not good for you. And this could lead to an object or a person getting like corrupted or even worse, death. And how it shows up is dependent on the phenomenon. So think about each assignment as like it's standalone X-Files episodes set in a steampunk London type setting. Are there people naturally born with magic in the world? There are, but they're like super rare. Most of the Candela Obscura crew, they're gonna use artifacts to deal with magic. And some of these trinkets can even lessen, contain, or get rid of bleed. And now onto the secret society business. Candela Obscura members are basically supernatural detectives, saving the world from one phenomenon at a time. So like I was saying, each assignment is kind of like a little X-Files episode where your team goes around, investigates like a Scooby-Doo mystery, and then after you're done solving that one and complete your goal, the Game Master will have another assignment for you, and it goes on like that in a series of episodic adventures. And now speaking of the Game Master, in this game he's called the Light Keeper. So when they go back to their Candela Obscura home base, the Light Keeper will be there to pat them on the back and let them know how good of a, or bad of a job they did with the previous assignment, and they'll be there to assign them new assignments. And the group that goes out on these little adventures for Candela Obscura, basically your adventuring party, that's gonna be called a circle. And so beyond the city of New Fair, there are actually Candela Obscura chapters all over the world, and each of them can access something called the Fourth Pharos, which is a trans-dimensional vault in the flare. So I guess you could think of the flare as something like a corrupted other real plane that sometimes reaches into our world through the thinnings, but for the most part is unreachable. So anyway, this fourth pharos, this trans-dimensional vault, it's like a lighthouse meets super secure storage area for all the potent stuff like books, artifacts, and phenomenon. So it's like a supernatural safety deposit box in another dimension that everybody can get access to if you're part of Candela Obscura. And this actually reminds me of a show called The Librarians, where their library could connect to various places all over the world, and they would store magic items in it. And to keep the vaults locked up nice and secure, the vaults are kind of guarded and maintained by these clockwork supernatural astrolabes. An astrolabe is like an analog planet and star calculator device. So there's magical astrolabes that maintain the security of this vault somehow. So how do you actually play this game? How does it play out? So here's how it works. Essentially everything in this game is a skill check. And in Candela Obscura, these skill checks are called actions. 
and every action is rolled with one or more six-sided die. There are nine skills available in the game, and the interesting thing is, the number nine comes up very often in this game. And as we go through the rules of the game, I'll point them out when they appear. So anyway, back to the skills that you can do as an action. The skills are broken into three major categories, nerve, cunning, and intuition. So there's three nerve skills, there's three cunning skills, and there's three intuition skills. The nerve skills are move, strike, and control. Move is when you wanna run, dodge, or navigate. Strike is when you wanna punch, break, or knock something down. And control is for driving, shooting, or doing something with finesse. Now under the category of cunning, there's three skills, sway, read, and hide. So sway is for convince, command, or consort. Read is for interpret body language, spot lies, and gather motive. Hide is for sneak, distract, and sleight of hand. And the final category of actions is intuition. And the intuition actions are survey, focus, and sense. Survey is for searching, tracking, or spotting. Focus is for inspecting, analyzing, and remembering things. And sense is for attuning, channeling, and revealing. And from first read, it's hard for me to really tell the difference between survey and sense, how you'd use them in game differently. Maybe sense is more focused on the magical side of things, and survey is more focused on the actual, like, observing things around you. So how this works is you'll be presented with some sort of challenge in front of you, and one of the players will say what they want to try to do, and the game master, aka the light keeper, will tell them what type of action that's going to be. And so once again, the actions are move, strike, control, sway, read, hide, and survey, focus, sense. Okay, so you're going to make an action roll. How do you figure out if it succeeds or fails? So in the game of Dungeons and Dragons, you roll a 20-sided dice and try to get a target number called a DC. That's not how this game works. In this game, if you roll a six, that's a success. And so as you can see, each action has three little circles under it. And depending on what kind of character you have or how advanced you are, how many sessions you've played and gained new skills and stuff like this, you may circle in zero, one, two, or three of those little bubbles. We'll get to that later. Here's another instance where nine appears. You've got three categories with three skills, and then each skill has three bubbles. This game is very beautifully made in a mathematical sense, one man's opinion. So the first thing you need to know is that this game only uses six-sided die. It uses what they call a dice pool system. So what that means is that the higher your skill is in a certain action, you get to roll more dice. So if you have zero points in a skill, you roll two six-sided die and take the lowest, sort of like disadvantage. If you have one point in a skill, you roll 1d6. Two points in a skill, you roll 2d6. And if you have three points in the skill, you roll 3d6. Simple enough. So how do you determine if you succeed or fail what you're trying to do? Let's put forth a little example scenario. Let's say your circle of investigators finds a locked treasure chest and you want to open it. And now let's say that you're a slink character and you want to pick the lock. Now the game master, aka Lightkeeper, is probably going to call for a hide check since that uses sleight of hand. Since you're a slink, you have two levels of skill in hide to start off with. So you would roll 2d6 to determine the results of trying to pick the lock on that chest. And now what you're really going to look at here is the value of the highest die that you roll. If you roll the 2d6, aka two six-sided dice, and the highest value shown on the die is a 1, 2, or 3, that means the roll is a failure, you don't accomplish what you wanted, and there are consequences. The consequence could be something like you break the lock, and even if you were to find the proper key, you're not going to get it open. If the highest value shown on the die is a 4 or a 5, then the roll is a mixed success. So you accomplish what you want, but it comes at a cost. So in this example, maybe you get the lock open, but when you get it open, it makes a very loud click that echoes down the hallway and perhaps alerts nearby people or things. Now, if the highest result is a six, the roll is a full success and you get what you want without any major unintended consequences. So in our chest example, you just open the chest, nothing bad happens, you get to see what's inside. Now, if you roll your 2d6 and both dice show six, that is a critical success. So all you need to have to get a critical success is two or more sixes shown. And what that means is you get what you want plus something extra. So what could happen here is the light keeper says, you get the chest open and while you're picking the lock, you actually figure out how the mechanism works and you'll always be able to pick that exact type of lock again in the future since you've figured out exactly how the internal mechanisms work some kind of little bonus like that. Now, as far as the good and bad consequences, where do those come from? Well, that's where the storytelling element of this game comes from. The Lightkeeper basically decides what the consequence would be, or he could even ask the players. So for example, if you've got a mixed success, the Lightkeeper could actually ask you, hey, you succeed in opening the chest, but there's gonna be a mixed result here. 
we need to have some sort of cost. What cost would you like to be reasonable here? So then the character could say, well, my lock picks break. That's one consequence. Or they could say what my example was with the loud echoing click down the hallway. Or they could come up with some other consequence and then the lightkeeper would approve or disapprove that decision. Now, another aspect of doing these skill checks like this is that the lightkeeper can tell the party ahead of time hey, this is a low risk, medium risk, or high risk action, which means the consequences of a failure or a mixed success, and also the benefits of a critical success would be amplified to some degree. So the basics of narrating what your character wants to do, the Lightkeeper tells you to roll a skill check action. That's all very straightforward. However, the game is deeper than just this, and there's ways you can enhance your chances of success. And the main way that is done is through a mechanic called drive. Now, if you look here on your character sheet, you'll see these little tick marks next to nerve, cunning, and intuition. And depending on your role and specialty, these will be distributed differently. We'll talk about role and specialty right after this, I promise. So still looking at the Slink character sheet here, he has three tick marks next to nerve and six next to cunning. And what these are is an expendable resource you can use to add die to your dice roll for very important actions where you really want a better chance to succeed. If you're using drive for your own roll, you can use as many of your drive points as you want on a single roll. So in our treasure chest example, our slink here could have chose to use all six of his drive points to add six more die to his die roll. And he would have rolled eight D6 to attempt his sleight of hand lock picking move. But then they would have to mark them off on their character sheet and they'd be no longer available until somehow replenished, which is exactly what happens in our next mechanic. So if you take a look here at the hide action on this character sheet, you'll see that the little diamond is bubbled in next to hide and read. Now, if our slink attempts the hide action or the read action on anything, for one of the dice that they roll in their skill check, they will replace it with what's called a gilded die, which is one die of a different color. So if they're just using 2d6 and a normal skill check, they would roll one die that's one color, that's the gilded die, and then they would roll another normal colored die that is the standard die. Now how the gilded die works is, you can always take the value on the gilded die, and if you do, you replenish one drive point in that category. So what this means is if the slink attempted to pick the lock and rolled 2d6, and let's say he got lucky and rolled a five and a six, but the five was on the gilded die and the six was on the standard die they now have a choice in front of them. Do they wanna take the full success on the standard die? Or they could take the mixed success by choosing to take the number five on the gilded die. But since they take the number on the gilded die, they replenish one drive point in cunning, which may come in handy later. Now you can't go above your maximum drive points in this manner, but it is a way to replenish your resources in the field. And what it does mechanically is encourage the players to take as many actions using their gilded actions during the adventure as possible. So a slink is gonna wanna use the read action and the hide action as much as possible. Because when they do, there's always that chance that they can replenish drive, which may come in very handy later in the adventure. Now, one last thing about drive is that you can spend one point maximum to help another player perform one of their actions, but you must explain narratively what you're doing to help. For example, let's say there was another character in the circle that wanted to help the slink by spending one drive point to help him pick that lock. He could say, but you gotta explain how you're gonna help him pick the lock. So how do you do that? Well, maybe you would say, my character happens to recognize the manufacturer of that lock and I happen to know that it has five tumblers. And so by giving that little bit of information to the slink, that's represented by the one additional D6 that the slink gets to roll to attempt to pick it. Now, any number of characters can use a drive point to help an ally with an action, but they can only contribute one drive point each to help an ally with their action. Now, there's one last mechanic involving actions here, and that's called resistance. So if you look on the character sheet under drive, you'll see the resistance bar. For every three points of maximum drive you have in each action category, you get one resistance point. If you roll your dice pool to perform an action and you really don't like the result, you can spend a resistance point in the proper category to try that action again. However, any drive points spent by you or by your allies to help, they don't apply anymore. You're re-rolling with your base stats. So let's say the slink got assistance from his buddy, rolled 3d6 to attempt to pick the lock on the chest, and he failed. He got a one, two, and a three on the die. He could spend a resistance point. He actually gets two because his maximum drive and cunning is six, and you get one point of resistance for each three points of maximum drive. It makes sense if you look at the character sheet right there. There's another example where the number nine shows up too because you have nine maximum drive, right? Three sets of three. He could use a resistance point to re-roll that, and he would roll 2d6 to try again. However, if you use resistance to try a roll again, you must take the result of the new roll. So if you got a mixed success, 
and you use a resistance point to re-roll and then you get a full failure, you gotta take that full failure. So if you get a mixed success, you may wanna think twice before using a resistance because the result may actually go downhill if you don't manage to roll a mixed success again. The next thing we're gonna look at is roles, specialties, and abilities. A role is kinda like what you think of as a character class. And you could look at a specialty sorta like a subclass. There are five roles in the game. Face, Muscle, Scholar, Slink, and Weird. The face can be a journalist or a magician. The muscle can be an explorer or a soldier. The scholar can be a doctor or a professor. The slink can be a criminal or a detective. And the weird can be a medium or an occultist. Included in the quick start guide, which I'll include in the description, they have five character sheets, one for each role. They have a slink criminal. They have a scholar professor. They have a face magician. They have a weird occultist, and they have a muscle explorer. If you look in the middle of the character sheet, that's where you can find the abilities that you get for being a certain role and certain specialty. So again, we're looking at the slink here. He has the ability of scout, and it's bubbled in, which means he gets that ability. You have to advance in the game to select more abilities. And what the ability of scout does is it says, if you have time to observe a location, you can spend one cunning to ask a question. What do I notice here that others do not see? What in this place might be of use to us? or what path should we follow? And when it says one cunning, what that means is one cunning drive point. So some of these abilities use your drive points as a resource to power them. Now we're gonna talk about this part over here on the right. The first part we're gonna look at is relationships. And in the quick start guide, it says in the full game, there's gonna be a system for determining relationships between the characters, but we don't have that yet. So for now, I guess you would just make it up. And, and that's cool. I'm excited to see what the full rules are when the full game comes out. Now let's take a look at gear. How does gear work in this game? Well, it's actually kind of interesting. You have a list here in the bottom right hand corner of your character sheet. And when you're on a mission, anytime you need one of these things, you can just say, I have it. And then you bubble it in and you can do that up to three times. So when you start, you have six options of items you could have. So for example, the slink would have a bleed detector, a hand weapon, a bleed containment vial, forged documents, burglary equipment, or body armor. So it's almost like when you're a kid on the playground and then somebody use their laser beam on you and you say, I have shielding. It's exactly like that. When the monster strikes down on you, you say, I have body armor. And then you bubble it in and you have body armor. And you can do that three times and pick three items right when you need them. And I think that's actually a really cool system. So speaking of body armor, how does taking damage and worse happen in this game? Whenever an event happens that would cause you to take damage, the game master will tell you to put a mark or maybe more than one mark in the category of body, brain, or bleed. Body is exactly what it sounds like. It's your physical body. Brain is your mental status and psychological strength. And bleed is more ephemeral. Bleed is like how uncorrupted you are by magic. So if you start taking marks of bleed, that means the magic from the fade is starting to enter into your mind and body and start to perhaps corrupt you a little bit. So what happens is if you get three marks in one of the categories, body, brain, or bleed, it's kind of a three strikes and you're out system. So let's say you got three marks in body. Well, what happened is you'd now collect a scar. I think of this like baseball. It's three strikes and you're out and then three outs in the inning. So if you take three marks in body, you'll get a scar. If you get three scars, you're a goner. And here's how scars work. Whenever you get a scar, it actually changes your character in some way. And what you do is you move one point from one of your actions to another one of your actions. So for example, let's say our slink here got three marks in body by taking damage in some way, and then he got a scar. And when you take a scar, you're actually unconscious in the scene. And not only that, your character would be sort of changed forever. When you take a scar, you select one point from one action and move it to another action. This represents how your character has been changed by the experience. So something our slink could do is he could take one point from strike and move it into his main skill of hide. And he could narrate that by saying, I'm a little bit gun shy now, and I'm a little bit more slink into the shadows after this harrowing experience, something along those lines. You come up with a narrative reason why your character would be changed by this scar. And you could even have a physical scar to show what happened. And like I say, just like baseball, three strikes and you're out, three ounce the innings over if you get three scars that's the end of your inning buddy this is another example where the number nine comes up three marks three scars and like i say once you take a scar you're unconscious in that scene but once your circle gets you somewhere safe however you define safe your character can kind of wake up and get back into the game and now on top of the character sheet you have for each player your actual party has a character sheet it's called the circle sheet 
And it's basically, like I said, it's a character sheet for your party. You get to name your party right away, and you write down the location where your chapter house is located. Probably in New Fair, that's the main city. And when you start the game, you get to choose one circle ability for your party. And there's six different ones you can choose from, and they're pretty powerful. For example, the first one here is called Stamina Training. It says your circle has three gilded dice at the beginning of every assignment that you may add to any roll. Once a die has been rolled, it is expended. So right off the bat, your party has a pool of three extra die. If you select that ability, there's five more, and they're right there on the circle sheet. If you look up here on the top of the sheet, you're gonna see what's called the illumination track. And what this is, is almost like a XP bar for your party to level up. So after each assignment, the game master is gonna ask you three questions. Did you contain or destroy a source of bleed? Did you provide comfort or support for those affected? Did you bring something of importance back for Candela Obscura to study. For every yes to those three questions, you bubble in three bubbles on the illumination track. So those three questions are focused on the party as a whole, but each character has individual goals too, which are called illumination keys. If you look at the bottom of their character sheet, you'll see the illumination keys for each character. For example, still looking at the slink, their illumination keys are do something illegal, make a deal, and stand up to authority. And all they need to do during the assignment is just do one of those things once to get credit. So if every single player in the circle completed at least one illumination key from the bottom of their character sheet, you get to bubble in four more bubbles up here on the illumination track. If you had a player that didn't achieve one of their illumination keys, unfortunately the party only gets two bubbles on their illumination track. And if nobody in the circle completed any of their illumination keys, which probably would not happen, but still, you get nada. When you fill in the circles all the way around the candle there in the illumination track, that means your party levels up, your circle levels up. And what that means is your circle gets to choose a new ability over here on the circle abilities, and everyone in the party gets to advance their character. When your character advances, you get to choose two out of these four options. You can add an action point to one of your actions. You can add two drive points to one of your action categories. You can take a new ability, which are the cool things that are in the middle row of your character sheet there. Or you can guild an additional action. So as you see, once you start advancing your character, there's a lot of different directions you can take it. Because not every character is going to select the same two options every time they advance. So the characters are going to start diverging away from the base template pretty quick. The darkened circles in the illumination track are considered milestones. And when you hit one of those, it may cause other abilities to trigger based upon that. In and of themselves, they do nothing, but there's other abilities that key off of milestones being hit. For example, this resource management circle ability, and it says when your circle hits a milestone on the illumination track, you can earn back one stitch, refresh, or train resource, which is what we're gonna talk about right now. Your circle, your actual party, has three expendable resource pools called stitch, refresh, and train. And if you look at the way it's set up on the circle sheet, it looks exactly like how drive is on the character sheet. And so each one starts out equal to the number of your circle members plus one. So example, if you have four people in your party, each one of those would start at five. The maximum would be five and the current total would be five. And these resources are usable between assignments. So between each assignment, a character can use up to two of the resources. They can't use all three, but they can use two. And here's what they do. Stitch will allow you to heal all of one player's marks. Refresh will fill all of one player's drives and resistances and Train will allow you to gain one bonus die that you can use on any roll in the next session. Notice it says Session, not Assignment. I would think the standard thing to do would be to heal up and get all your points back, but I guess if you don't need to heal up or you don't need to get any of your drive points back, then you have the ability to Train, which gives you that one bonus die to use next time. And there you have it. That's the rules for Candela Obscura as we know them. The full game's coming out later this year. I'm excited to see what's in the full rule book because this is just the quick start guide. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. I'm thinking about doing a video on the setting of Candela Obscura and all the lore and stuff like that. Let me know in the comments if you think that'd be cool. Talk to you later. Bye.